right, we'll uh, come back into session after our break. We next on our agenda, we have a bison range update um, led by Shane Morjo, Steph Gillen, and Brian Upton. So come on up and give us an update on the bison range. And Shannon. The Fab Four, come on up. So uh, council and, and everyone, um, the council's directed us to work on trying to um, put together a, a celebration of the bison range restoration and uh, council members Langford and council members Charlo and um, Shane and Steph and um, Gwen have all done a lot of work on that. And what we've put together so far is uh, per council direction, a three day celebration uh, around the weekend of May 21st. Um, what we have uh, in planning stages is, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, on Friday, May 20th, um, it would be a tribal member focused celebration day at the bison range with uh, a mini powwow and a, a community feed um, and then probably another a number of other events and things going on that day and um, Saturday, May 21st, um, we'd expect to put together a, a kind of public celebration similar to what the tribes had when um, the tribes acquired the dam back in 2015. Um, a really nice um, large event again with a, a, a feed and um, probably some some commemorative souvenirs for the the historic occasion and on Sunday um, at the bison range, probably having a, a, a just a more reservation community general public focused celebration at the range, um, maybe discounted uh, admission at the bison range and that sort of thing. So that's that's what we're starting to, to plan out and getting a lot of work done and probably doing a lot more work over the next couple months. Um, but I'll, I'll turn it over um, in case I forgot anything or anyone wants to amplify anything about what, what we have planned for the event so far. Thank you, Brian. Yes, yes, yeah. <clears throat> oh, sorry, those three songs were a lot, <laughs> but very, uh, very uh, good for my Salish soul this morning. Um, so with the tribal member celebration, we have been uh, meeting with our Bison Range staff um, that in working on the event and what it might look like, as Brian mentioned, we were thinking 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. Um, mini powwow, we were thinking from noon to four, Jimmy. So um, we are also talking about doing cultural activities, uh, native games, possibly drying meat. We're gonna try to work through that, um, those uh, details. So yeah, that was kind of, you know, of course the, Visitor center will be open, the museum will be open for people to be able to uh, visit and you know do the tours, the tour road will be open as well. So we'll think of different activities to focus on our tribal member um, community and you know honor and and celebrate with them during that throughout that day. Go ahead, Jimmy. Yes, Jeff. Did you say that powwow was planned for four o'clock? From noon to four p.m. Yeah. Okay. So we figured, you know, I'll reach out to drum groups, and if anyone's, you know, interested in contacting me, that would be great. Um, and then we would do kind of, you know, um, intertribals, and maybe even focus on the different dance, um, you know. Cool. showcasing the different dances and good. yeah so good. that's what that we're thinking okay. thank you yep Who now? mr chairman council members the only thing i would add is um of course as we work through like the logistics side um there's a lot of things we still have to get figured out as far as food and 
um, you know, all the organizing pieces. So we'll just keep working on that. Um, I think we have a really good team and everybody's taking on bits and pieces of everything. So that's really nice. Um, I did um, send over the, just the draft of the artwork that Antoine uh, Sandoval did for us. Um, Jennifer just put that up on the screen there um, for you all to see. So just to give you an idea of what the artwork's gonna look like um, for, for the event. So we plan to do stickers, posters, um, t-shirts, and we'll probably uh, be ordering um, 2,000 of each of those um, for the membership and the public for the, for the event. So yeah, we're pretty excited about, and this will be put into like, a, we're gonna actually make some more generic type artwork t-shirts so that the visitor center has, if there's leftovers that they can actually um, have them for sale there. Um, and then the poster will have more direct in event info on it um, for the celebration. Thank you, Martin, for putting that on the screen. Go ahead, Martin. I was just going I wasn't sure if Shane heard about my statement earlier, but if we have a, if our budget goes too much, we're going to have a deduction and they, everyone can thank you for our per capita. So just be, be ready for that. We're going big or going home, right? Shane? <laughs> we'll have to take a look at my budget after this and see if you guys can expand it a little bit. <laughs> I think it's probably going to be pretty much cashed out after this. So. I said 110%, Shane, where you kind of work for free. No, April Fools. No, we wouldn't do that to you. Any other, any questions about the event plan for the 20th through the 22nd? I know we really look forward to it and uh, we hope that it's good weather and uh, things go well and uh, the invitees that, that we have out there show up and really appreciate your work on it. So thank you. Yes, go ahead, Steph. Uh, Mr. Chair, I'm wondering, do you want a short update from Shannon and I as far as the, okay. So as far as the museum remodel is, it goes, it is almost complete. It's amazing to see um, it come alive uh, and pretty honored to be involved in that process. Um, so we have about three small walls left and one left in the lobby area as you walk in. Uh, we are waiting for security box to be moved so we can uh, finish uh, uh, with that wall. Uh, our front desk remodel, that's the only small area that needs to be complete that might be pushed into next year due to contracts. And um, we're already starting to pick up, uh, visitation is, is starting to pick up and it's getting crazy out there. So that might be pushed off till next year. Um, we are, David and David Rockwell and I just met yesterday and we are going to start moving outside to develop signs for the trails. And, you know, as uh, Chairman Tom McDonald had mentioned, you know, thinking outside the fence, which I use all the time. And I credit you <laughs> every time I use it. But um, so on that trail around the visitor center, focusing on uh, the Mission Mountains, uh, focusing on Ferry Basin, focusing on, you know, the the uh, pass, focusing, you know, just on so many things uh, throughout the reservation and, you know, all of our accomplishments, um, working on to the walking paths, the Bitterroot Trail, um, High Point, we're working with Salish, uh, Salish and Kalispell uh, Culture Committee. Uh, they have developed place name signs for the Mission Mountain Range that we will be putting up, um, hopefully prior to the uh, Mother's Day weekend. Um, and, and, you know, just education signs, um, rattlesnakes, bull snakes, we have them both, and just ed educating the public. Um, last year, we had someone not run over the rattlesnake on the road, which we were so appreciative of, but they got out of their car and tried to help shoo it off the road. So we, uh, <laughs> we will, yeah, we don't want that happening. So, or anything happening because of that. So um, educational programs are starting to pick up. We've had a visit from Mission uh, Boys and Girls Club, which was pretty uh, exciting. I shared my enthusiasm for SCAT. And so all of them had their little magnifiers and uh, I got a great picture, but um, I don't know if the teachers were as I'm excited. I'm sure everybody knows what the word SCAT oh, means. It's a scientific nice word for poo. <laughs> so <laughs> we found coyote SCAT on the trail that had a jaw of a mouse in it. So we all thoroughly looked at that 
and they were just as excited as I was. Um, this summer, we are looking at picking up a lot of our educational programs. Um, I met with Marie Trojan and Three Chiefs Cultural Center. They want to bring cultural events to the bison range because they don't have a venue to host that. And I'm pretty excited about that. We could add science to that um, and do the walk with them, you know, and participate with them at any um, level that we can. So pretty excited about that. With that, I'll hand it over to Shannon to give you an update on bison range numbers. Thank you, Council uh, Chairman McDonald. Um, a week ago or so, Tom requested to have some numbers from last year's takeover of the bison range, um, or handover, I guess. Um, I put together some of the numbers that we had. I was hoping to have a, a big game flight done by a drone service that we had on contract this year, but he was overwhelmed by the number of animals that were actually on the bison range. So um, I couldn't get a truly accurate count of uh, like the elk herd and um, the numbers of bison for sure, but I will give you what I have. Um, currently, or when we we stepped foot onto the bison range as tribal workers, uh, we we uh, had an elk herd that numbered around 300. Um, the there has been an ongoing effort between. Um, even with the Fish and Wildlife Service to reduce that number just due to the fact that the one elk can eat as much forage as 80% um, um, of a bison. So, so uh, the competition is quite large there with the elk herd. And I, I don't wanna take them all out because a lot of people really like the big bulls. So um, I had our reductions focused on females this year. We didn't, we ended up taking out 40 head um, and servicing 10 tribal programs. Um, pronghorn antelope, uh, it, the numbers on them aren't looking real great. Um, last year at the end of the summer after fawning, we had nine females and six males. Um, a total of 16 fawns were born, but only two made it to August. Uh, and the reason for that is uh, the coyotes on the range were really heavily depredate on this herd of uh, pronghorn. Bighorn sheep are pretty sad also. Um, since they contracted pneumonia several years back, that herd has gone from 220 head to 11 ewes, three rams, and three lambs. Um, and uh, the, the guy doing the research on it, Jack Hogg, um, keeps asking if we're going to perpetuate that herd. Um, I don't really have an answer for him right now, but um, after a herd contracts pneumonia, it's really hard to rebound for numbers um, because the ones that are semi-immune to the disease give it to the newborns. And so the dying just continues and they just kind of barely tread water. Um, so that's just kind of a waiting game, I think, um, on that. I, I don't want to bring new sheep in at a high expense and have them die. Um, our capture operations from last year, we ran through the chutes, um, 276 head of bison. Uh, 161 of those were females, 115 were males, and uh, left out in the field were probably around 30 males. Um, there wasn't a, a positive count on them. So our, our herd runs about 300. Um, we pulled out 27 and sold all of those. Uh, most of them went to other herds, but there were a few that were bought by private individuals for, for meat. So um, at the, the Roundup event, we worked through the shoots, 163 of these bison and uh, 58 calves. <clears throat> so the bison donations um, from last year, we, we uh, donated five to Rocky Boys Reservation. 
um, to help um, perpetuate their food sovereignty program, along with um, um, Prairie Reserve, um, also donated 11 to them. Um, Oh, I, when I was over in Rocky Boy for their dedication, I I heard a very interesting um, fact that um, the guy that was hitting their program for food sovereignty told me, I, back in around 2011, we cooperated Fish, Wildlife and Parks to help capture and donate 25 bighorn sheep to the Rocky Boys Reservation. They put them on a preserve on the reservation and um, to date, he figures there's around 220 head, and that helps their um, financial situation. They sell off several trophy tags every year, and um, substantial funds come from that. So, um, also, to mention about our capture operation, um, with the three days that we worked all the bison, um, it was a um, both for personnel and bison, um, incident free. So there were no accidents, no broken bones, um, and everything stayed really calm. So that from a change from the past, from when I worked there last on the first AFA, um, I think we had to put down around four in that event. So it, that's really positive, um, to work them slow and just take our time on them rather than trying to ram them down through the through the shoots. I got some numbers from Antoine for visitor numbers um, and off the counter, he, he totaled up uh, 21,331. Oh, sorry, that's passes sold last year. Um, he figured there were and on average um, two to three people per car, not counting the big um, Greyhound buses that come in for tours and events. Um, so he figured there could have been up to 70,000 visitors um, from the time we took over. Um, he said that also does not reflect the drive by. So, <laughs> but um, that's all I've got. But if you have any questions, um, I'm willing to answer them. Thank you, Shannon. I guess one of the things you might want to um, just kind of explain a little bit of how um, these bighorn sheep uh, got pneumonia or how, why are sheep so um, sensitive to that? Certainly. Um, bighorn sheep are a kind of a naive species when it comes to diseases. Um, pretty much it's, it's like uh, the native peoples were to the Europeans. We weren't um, we were very susceptible to diseases that they were immune to. Um, and for bite bighorn sheep, um, pneumonia is a great factor for them. Um, and the way they get it is they, with nose to nose contact with domestics. Um, it can be sheep and it can be goats. These sheep had consistently um, got out holes where coyotes, wolves, and bears had dug under the fence on the bison range. And we had consorted efforts um, in conferences with FWS about this, um, trying to keep, tell them, have them keep their sheep in as a pre preventative for them. Um, we did have a little bit, bit of pushback from an old biologist that was there. Um, and sadly, within a year, the uh, herd got contracted pneumonia. And it, it uh, so sheep are very social. Um, they touch noses within the herd and it didn't take but two years to pretty much wipe that herd out. Thank you, Shannon. Um, one of the important things, and this goes to Brian's skill set and, and attributes. Um, one of the things in the um, ability that we were able to do through through Brian's persistence is actually make sure that there was a deferred maintenance fund that came came forward and, and maybe Brian, you could you know, briefly mention that right now. And and I guess uh, Shannon, I know there's a lot of projects that will be used for that uh, funding. Also, I don't know if you want to you know spotlight some of that, but I'll, I'll ask Brian first about uh, that that funding. So, Mr. Chairman and Council, um, 
when the tribes in the tribes legislation to restore the bison range, the tribes instituted a two year transition period. And part of that was just um, for transition of staffing and making sure everything was done smoothly and it didn't have to be done too quickly. So the resource didn't suffer. Um, and part of that is also to allow for uh, there to be um, a window for the, the federal government to help um, address a lot of the things that haven't been addressed there for decades. Um, so the deferred maintenance funding you're talking about, uh, the Interior Department and the tribes worked together to get uh, $5.4 million secured for the bison range to address the, um, the great backlog of deferred maintenance that's there. Uh, I think most people that have been there are pretty familiar with uh, a lot of the things that could be done there. Um, so that will hopefully, you know, start putting the tribes on a, a good foot to, to do some great things at the bison range and then separate from that, um, hoping to um, secure some funding for a visitor center because the, the Fish and Wildlife Service had for decades realized that the visitor center they have was outdated and needed to be replaced. It was always back burnered, and um, now the tribes will have an opportunity to to do what the tribes see fit there with respect to that, and hopefully there will be more federal support for that as well, so um, the the public and everybody can benefit from that. Thank you, Brian. Some of the backlog issues that um, were piling up on Fish and Wildlife Service um, before the transfer were um, facilities, um, structure, infrastructure. All the buildings were kind of going dilapidated. Um, they're all very old, um, so they're in constant need of updates. Um, that was one of the big ones. Um, weed sprain, they're way behind on their weed sprain. Um, Vent and nada is a huge problem on the bison range. Um, and once that grows, it's, it's a lot like cheatgrass. It's a winter annual, but it's so high in silicates that animals don't eat it. And so when it, when it uh, matures out, the seeds get spread via vehicles, um, personnel walking, or even um, the animals. So it spreads rapidly. Um, right now, we've got kind of a elevation line on that that I'm gonna try and push to helicopter spray, hopefully, um, and kind of stop that upward movement. Um, other projects where there's some bridges that are in need of re replacement, they're rotted out on the um, east end and um, the north side of the um, personal access points down by the shop. Uh, some of the roads are in bad need of maintenance. The, the crew just dug up all the cattle guards and the Fish and Wildlife Service hadn't done that for years. And several of them had rotted out to the point to where you only got one way, one place you can drive through on them. So they have them coned off. Um, they're gonna try and fix them enough to for Mother's Day opening to open that other side back up. But um, since his cattle guard is on order and he's figuring 90 days out. Um, vehicles, vehicles were left dilapidated. Uh, in fact, I just tried to start up one yesterday and um, it clicked and the battery is dead. And then I wiggled the key and the key just flopped around in the ignition. Uh, <laughs> I don't know how they started it before, but, <laughs> um, but many of the vehicles are that way. And um, when Fish and Wildlife Service left, we were kind of left with a bill on that. Um, you know, if you replace that with an electric Ford F-150, you don't need a key. It's a, it's a button. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're still waiting on the bikes. <laughs> um, let's see what else. Some of the visitor center stuff um, trying to bring us up to um, code for Disabilities Act. I, that's going to be a, a pretty costly project. Um, replacing some of the broken down retaining walls where the visitors walk in. Um, and then also one of the huge costs that is going to happen here and it has already started to happen is fencing. Um, the wooden posts are, a lot of them are completely rotted out and the, the stays on the corners 
are completely rotted out and the staff has been really working hard on trying to replace them, um, but they are at a shortage of posts and poles right now. And until that <clears throat> budget was approved, um, they were kind of on hold on these projects. So those are just some of the ones that I can think of offhand. Um, Steph might be able to add to that. We can go on and on, <laughs> but um, HVAC system, uh, the, I'm between two offices, so not there all the time, but the heater did start working when it was below zero. So that was good for the crew. But other than that, it's uh, not functioning properly. Uh, we did have roof repairs done. That was through Fish and Wildlife Service, which was great. Um, we did have some problems in the winter when ice built up and had called them and they came back and fixed it. I think we had some ice build up is all we're hoping. Um, as far as the road, we are working with um, safety of dams and their services um, to get those roads graded here soon. And also looking on, at the Buffalo Prairie Road for some improvements. It's not necessarily made for two-way traffic. We have the meandering of the creek that happens naturally. Um, so we're just kind of concerned about safety. Um, it is open, you know, throughout the winter months and it's a dirt road. So it's great when it's cold because it stays, um, you know, easy, it's easy to drive because it's compacted, but once it starts to thaw and we've had so many freeze thaw events that uh, even in my four wheel drive vehicle, it was kind of squirrely. So, you know, figuring out different things and safety issues. Um, yeah. There's oh yeah. So internet too, it is, um, like traveling back in time <laughs> <laughs> and the internet, the cell service, um, I think you're only like, you know, 20 air miles from hot springs. Yeah. <laughs> So if we didn't depend highly on the internet and cell service, it would be great, but trying to function one day, you get a call at a spot, the next day you don't, you know, sometimes your text messages don't come in until you leave. So just uh, working with it to get us functioning, fully functioning, you know, as a program out there is a big, a big, and, and for safety issues as well, we do have sweeps you know that run but you know if someone breaks down there's no cell service there for them to to get help so we so there's lots to do thank you steph thank you shannon um you know that beautiful artwork um sandoval's picture reminded me of um big medicine so shane what's what's the update with bringing him back thank you mr chairman um council members i I've been in contact with uh, Nancy Fonicello, who is the conservator um, with Ancient Artways Conservation. Um, Nancy's also done a lot of the restoration work for the People Center Fire, um, the items that were um, damaged in that, and she's done a lot of great work in restoring those. Um, right now, we're um, in conversations with her to uh, see about having her go over to Helena and assess uh, Big Medicine to, just to give us um, her opinion as a conservator as to the type of shape he's in. Um, she won't be giving us an assessment on what it would take to um, essentially repair him or restore him. Um, we'd probably have to um, chat with a, a taxidermist um, to have that conversation, but she is going to go in and assess, you know, what type of shape he's in and um, the quality of the materials and can give us an idea anyways, what it would take. Um, she is going to connect me with Molly, um, is it Kruckenberg, um, the new director at the Montana Historical Society. Um, it sounds like they are interested in also doing a new assessment and have actually had conversations with her as well to do that. Um, both uh, Montana Historical Society and the tribes have both used Nancy. She's great, gives honest opinions. Um, so we feel good about that. Uh, you know, one of the main reasons we wanted to have a new assessment done is because when it was done, um, if you read a lot of the documents, uh, in my opinion, some of them came across fairly biased. Um, I felt like, plus also they're, they're outdated at this point and it's probably just a good time to have a new assessment done. Um, at that point, we can, you know, first off, we need to talk to Molly and, and make sure we're all on the same page and having Nancy go over and do that. 
Um, Nancy will give us an estimate at what it would cost to have her go do the assessment, and then we can get approval to have her go over and do that assessment for us. From there, we can kind of look at where, what the shape is of big medicine, if we need to get a taxidermist over there, um, and then continue to have conversations about what it might take to um, get him brought home. So um, that's farther down the road, but we're still having conversations and um, things are in motion to at least get new assessments done. Um, thanks. Is there any questions from council or any questions from anybody in the audience for the with regard to the vice range? If not, uh, we'll move on to the next topic. Thank you so much for your update. Thank you very much. So water compact update, I see that um, we have Rob in the room. Casey, Casey's online. Okay. Okay. Casey, are you there? Una, chest squexed. Chinupin, Ches Squex Pesia. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of council. Uh, good morning, everyone present. We are, I'm joined uh, today by my colleagues, Rob there in the council. I have Seth Makepeace and uh, Jace here as well. And we are very grateful for the opportunity to speak to you a little bit about some of the compact implementation activities uh, that we have been working on here in our program. So I will, uh, this is a large topic that is a focus of work for so many dedicated people within the tribal organization. We're just going to telescope in briefly and touch on a few things that we're working on, and that is water monitoring and measurement, uh, some of the technical work that we're doing in terms of water conservation, and Jace is going to touch on irrigation, rehabilitation, and betterment. So I'll kick us off with water monitoring, measurement and management. And we'll talk a little bit about our water monitoring network. So many of you who've been out and about on the reservation have seen a lot of these sideways culverts and some of these high-tech measurement networks. So if you were to go on a, a scavenger hunt, you would find about 90 of these throughout the reservation. These are how we measure water on the reservation. Uh, the left one is a stilling well, and the right one is called a bubbler station. And what these do is they measure the level of water. We then combine this information with field visits from our hydrologic technicians, and that tells us how much water that we have in the canals and the rivers at any given time. We then use uh, these satellite telemetry setups to beam this information through a satellite network, and then we can pick this up and actually read this information in real time from a laptop or from a cell phone. In terms of the data handoff here on the right hand side, uh, that is the data flow that we use. We first uh, download it in a field data collection platform. That's then bounced off NOAA's GOES satellite network. That's then downloaded into the data collection uh, system DCS toolkit. That's handed into a software called Aquarius Data Acquisition Software, then to a software called Aquarius Time Series that's then run through a rating curve to be published live to our Aquarius web portal software. And I just highlight that to show you that you've got a lot of uh, really smart folks out there working on bringing this information in from the field into our hydrologic database uh, to make it displayable in real time for uh, the tribal public as well as for the irrigation project. Here is our measurement network. So each one of these stations, these dots represents a measuring locations that the tribe have. This is a screenshot of our website. And if you uh, Google the CSKT water management program, you'll find a link so that you can look at this live on the internet. This is a product that uh, we're, we think brings a lot of utility. Uh, back in the day, staff would have to drive out and physically uh, read a staff gauge to get the real-time flow at any one of these sites. Now we've hooked them up with satellite telemetry so you can actually get on your cell phone and you can look at this information just with the touch of a button. 
This has provided a lot of benefit to the Tribal Natural Resources Department, as well as to the irrigation project, as you can imagine. Having data on where water is coming from, where water is, and where water is going has been absolutely instrumental in helping the irrigation project into coming into the new era uh, of water resource management that's required under the compact. So one of the things that we use our data for is in-stream flow compliance checks. So we have 28 locations on the reservation where there are actually minimum flows that the irrigation project has to keep in streams. And so what we've done is we've configured our website to be able to do this check in real time. Once upon a time, people would actually have to drive out to these locations physically or look them up one by one in the database. But what we've done is we've set up a little stoplight uh, dashboard, if you will. So a red, yellow, green display where the green locations are streams that are meeting these in-stream flows. Yellow is locations that are getting kind of close and red is locations where these in-stream flows for fisheries are not being met. I took this screenshot in the off season. So this is just low flows that we tend to see in the winter. But as you can imagine during periods such as the upcoming irrigation season, this is absolutely invaluable information for our staff as well as for the irrigation project staff. Another check that we do on this website is there are wasteway return flows. So imagine flood irrigation waters, uh, they're very hot, they have lots of nutrients in them and they, are, uh, they have to go somewhere. And so often they're discharged into waterways. There are maximum allowable levels for these return flows. And so we set up our website as well as our measurement network to be able to look at those compliance checks in real time. Instead of going back after the season and seeing how we did, now we can address it in real time. And if there's an issue, we can go out and we can correct it immediately. The other thing that our hydrologic technicians have been up to is presently for the reservoirs, the irrigation project relies on, on physical checks. So that can include drives up to Black Lake, uh, Jocko Lake, you know, pretty significant round trip drive times. And so what we're doing now is we're installing our measurement equipment on the reservoirs themselves. So that way the irrigation project has access to reservoir levels and storage volumes in real time, which we anticipate uh, is gonna be of significant benefit to integrated water management on the project. And then another item that your technical staff is up to. Uh, so Cody Goklish has been involved in the, in the water measurement network. Brian Hoganson has been involved in water reallocation efforts. And so what I mean by that is, Jace is gonna talk a bit about uh, the rehabilitation and betterment projects here in a moment. So for each one of those, it's written in the compact that if the tribes can demonstrate that we are conserving water as part of that project, then we can actually reallocate that water saved towards increased in-stream flows for fisheries up to our target in-stream flows. And once we achieve those, then we actually split the benefit with the irrigation project. So that's very exciting. This does involve a lot of technical work that is being conducted by uh, the water resources team. So here's George McLeod out there measuring seepage on one of the irrigation canals last season. We're gonna be involved in these seepage uh, scientific studies during this irrigation season as well. And that's gonna inform the technical work that our program is gonna do to help bring more flows into streams. The other com uh, concept introduced by the compact is this idea of adaptive water management. So I mentioned that we currently have 28 locations where there are minimum in-stream flows on reservation streams. And these in-stream flows, they don't change. They're static throughout the whole year. So as three examples, here's Big Knife Creek, two CFS, Jocko River uh, below the K Canal there at the mouth of the canyon, that's 44 cubic feet per second they have to meet and Agency Creek is eight, that's year round. So this lower left picture is a graph of flow over time in the Jocko River there at the mouth. And that red line is the in-stream flow that the irrigation project has to meet. Under the compact, this is going to change uh, pretty significantly. So what it does is it shifts us to a in-stream flow that is defined that varies by month. And so not only do these in-stream flows vary by month, but there's also multiple in-stream flows at some locations. 
If you look at the graph on the right, this shows the in-stream flows in purple. So that's for a very wet year. The green is for a normal year. And then the orange line down there at the bottom, that's the, the driest years. So the irrigation project is gonna to have to switch to managing uh, by month. And these in-stream flows are going to be phased in. So these don't start tomorrow, but they're phased in by service area starting five years from when the compact was effective. So the goal here is to provide the irrigation project with all the data that they need to be successful so that they can ensure that irrigators receive the same amount of water that they have historically received, while also ensuring that they can satisfy the senior in-stream flow rights of the CSKT. Another neat thing is that we are able to, through the compact implementation technical team, we can adjust these allocations based on the irrigation season, based on water supply, and then we can also shift it based on seasonal climate variability and irrigation management considerations. So, for example, if we start to see spring runoff happening earlier every year, we can actually adjust these targets to more mimic uh, the natural hydrographs that we would see. Other little projects uh, that we're up to, uh, our measurement program is highly involved in measurement that benefits the tribes and tribal services, such as teaming up with our water quality program for water quality measurements. We also are uh, finishing out our build out at the reservoirs. We've currently installed nine of those. Uh, we have six more to install this fall. We're enhancing our water data website in new and exciting ways, including building a tool so that the irrigation project can track what are called river diversion allowances. So in the future, the irrigation project is going to have blocks of water that they can deliver every year. And so we're building tools to help them track that water. We're working on hydrologic and scientific studies so that we can quantify and return the water saved from the irrigation project rehabilitation projects into streams. We're working on this concept of adaptive management and the scientific studies that we need to have in place to make that successful. The tribes have another uh, number of in-stream flow water rights that they're granted under the compact. The tribes do have to do a bit of scientific work and study to get those perfected. And so we're turning our eyes towards the scientific work to get those accomplished as well. And then of course, our crew is involved in a lot of special measurement projects, including for some of the upcoming irrigation service area master planning efforts that Jason and Seth are gonna talk about. So with that, uh, that's a bit of the work that our technical unit is doing. I would now like to turn it over to my colleague, Jay Smith, and he's gonna to talk to you about FIP rehabilitation and betterment efforts. Good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen of council. Uh, <clears throat> I'll just uh, start walking through these slides. Uh, this is this is kind of our top 10 uh, project list right here. Uh, you know, we, you can see here, uh, John K Headworks, we're currently uh, just actually waiting on uh, some final permits from the Army Corps of Engineers. We'll be starting that project this summer. I think our, you know, by July, you'll see some activity there. Uh, you know, start of construction. Um, we're, we're in final design and permitting for the Lower J Headworks right there at River Valley. Uh, North Fork Jocko, uh, the Tabor Diversion, um, we'll, we'll highlight that here shortly, the uh, Upper Jocko S Fish Ladder, which is a, a priority for our fisheries, uh, CSKT fisheries team. Um, we'll be working on the Falls Creek Headworks next year, uh, early next year. Um, and then we got uh, the North Jocko uh, uh, K Canal System, uh, the conversion project there from open dish to closed pipe. Uh, we're, we're starting to work on permitting there and, and the initial uh, scoping of uh, uh, product securement, essentially buying pipe. Um, we got the Valley View 31A Canal Shoot, which is a, a BIA wind funded uh, project. Uh, ongoing work, the Flathead River Pumping Plant, uh, the Charlotte Planning Area, we're, we're in the middle of contracting with the uh, selected uh, uh, solicitor there. And then a uh, project that we haven't talked much about, but it's on our radar is, is the uh, modification and uh, uh, betterment of the fish screening at Placid Creek in the upper uh, Placid drainage off the reservation that 
delivers water to the upper drop of the uh, lakes. Uh, kind of a timeline here, it's, it's gonna get real busy, uh, especially starting uh, this fall um, when we get kicked off at uh, Jocko K Headworks, but uh, a line of work for, for several years to come. Um, Uh, here's just a pinpoint of the Jocko K Headworks, you know, up in the, the mouth of Jocko Canyon um, as it comes out into the valley. Uh, some pictures here of the existing structure. This will all be demolished and, and modernized with a, uh, a, a fish, modern fish passage and, and uh, selective passage. Actually, this will continue to do what fisheries has always uh, done here. But we're going to uh, step up the, the fish ladder and um, a Kwanda screen and uh, we'll continue to divert 180 CFS here. Uh, that, that's the, the capacity design of the, the new system. Here's the current fish screen, um, not uh, it works, but it's, it's not, it's not uh, adequate for, for fisheries uh, as we go forward. Um, here's the layout. Uh, you can see over to the, to the right-hand side here, that's the new, uh, engineered spillway. So that's something that's currently not at the, the Dark Arcade Works. Um, the spillway is just earthen, uh, really typical of a, a 1920s uh, structure. But we're gonna come in, we're gonna engineer that, riprap and, and place material there to make sure we don't have washouts. But uh, and then we'll rebuild, we'll demolish the current headworks. While we're doing that, we'll actually use the emergency spillway as we'll reroute the drop through it with uh, basically, uh, giant uh, sacks of, uh, of sand, um, create a, a dike across the river and, and reroute it. And then we'll fill in the current four bay. We'll be, we'll be filled in with uh, uh, you know, the proper material or basically dirt. We'll get probably somewhere uh, in the Jocko Valley um, and fill in and uh, eliminate the four bay, eliminate the current fish screen. Everything will happen at the, at the structure um, going forward. And so uh, you know, we'll, we'll be able to keep that water cooler and uh, and still meet the, the irrigation demand on the uh, the north side of the valley uh, on the Draco K system. Uh, some some engineered uh, pictures here <coughs> of the new system. Um, uh, moving down to Lower J, there's you know you see the loop come down the hill from the Bison Range into River Valley uh, and Highway 200 shooting off of 93 there. You know, it's been around for 100 plus years at this point, kind of big, uh, you know, as we move forward, one of our deals was to lessen the visual impact and, uh, you know, kind of restore the natural uh, Jocko River corridor um, to, uh, to minimize the, the impact that the, the irrigation project has on the river. Here's the, the current layout of the, of the, of the Jocko K diversion. You know, we've got a big four bay channel past the, the, the diversion in the river. Um, fish screen is uh, uh, kind of a fifth 80s design, which which included a Kwanda screen and a and a, a, a mechanical uh, wiper. Another problem here: we have both a Montana Rail Link right away and the State Highway right away, so that's added some permitting uh, a timeline to to the project. So we've already actually begun permitting those, um, even though we're still working towards final design on the the actual footprint and. Off to the north here, or, or to the right hand of the picture, that's the Johnson uh, Hayfield. If you guys remember back in the day, there was a pivot out there. Um, Fisheries and Wildlife was able to secure that property. So we're actually going to do some enhancement out there. So we're incorporating that into uh, our, um, our permitting with Army Corps to make sure that we, you know, we, we can actually you know, enhance the wetlands, enhance some of the, the, the tree features that, uh, that currently exist. Yeah, here's a kind of an engineer drawing potential layout shows the uh, rough and channel fish fish ramp that will replace the current structure. Um, shows the pipeline. You can't really see it that well, but basically the pipeline follows the access road, and the current ditch will be reclaimed and brought back to natural grade and enhanced for for wetland features. So here's a close up of the the rough and channel and the uh, <coughs> intake screens. To deliver water to the lower J camp. 
as we jump up to the North Fork, the Jocko, a uh, lot of uh, infrastructure up here, uh, to put it lightly. Um, in the lower left, you can see the, the S Canal diversion. That's where we're going to enhance the fish ladder. Um, the fisheries is requested. Hey, uh, Martin has a question. Yeah, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair, um, Casey, Jace. Um, I was at a district meeting down in Dixon last week. Um, and I'm, I think that's the J Canal that goes along the highway there, kind of. Um, it is, yeah. They, they said that for whatever reason, it wasn't shut off this year. And they noticed that there weren't any elk fatalities on that stretch of highway because the elk were just going to that um, canal drinking and not going all the way down to the Jocko. And I'm just curious about that being something that, you know, I know it's not efficient, but um, for whatever reason, um, you know, it obviously helped our wildlife. So I'm just curious if that's any kind of a consideration to, to kind of reduce the elk fatalities there. You, you know, Martin, the, so the lower Jake now um, does have a stock water. Uh, that's why FIPS running water down there. Um, so they have a, a winter stock water use or a fall winter. Um, that's a good observation. You know, that's, that's the great thing about the, the, the district meetings is you guys are able to hear from the community of the things that, that they see working and not working. And so, um, you know, that's something we can, you know, we, we we're just changing the diversion. The, the management of the canal is obviously uh, something that can be altered and, and progressed as we move forward um, with the uh, you know CSKT and the interaction with BIA and FIP. And FIP. Um, but but you know, that's a great uh, great tidbit, possibly a, a kudo and a nugget a nugget for for future operations, no doubt. Um, Um, yeah, jumping back up to the North Fork, we uh, just a lot going on up here. Um, you know, so we're going to be working down lower left there. That's the, the upper Eskinel diversion. And then in the upper right, you can see kind of the, <clears throat> the box there. So the big things to, to take in at, at North Fork Tabor diversion, um, you know, as we got the, the, the middle fork feeder bring water in. Uh, and, uh, you know, we have this, you know, you know very old, large uh, diversion structure. Uh, and you can see here the four bay, which is <laughs> when during divergence season, it's essentially filled with water, as you can see on the right hand, um, creates a lot of sediment. As you can see here, we got some pictures on the left showing the sediment buildup. Um, FIP's been doing a better job in recently working with, with, with Barfoot and, and, and the fisheries team to sluice properly. We're, they're, they're, it's still being worked out, it's getting better. Um, but uh, you can see here some, some sediment sluicing fissures on the right, one with, you know, obviously showing the, the dirty water going through, um, which, which helps with downstream propagation of uh, fisheries habitat and moving sediment through the system in a more natural environment. Um, and that's, these are, what we're talking about here, these are features where, where as we look at redesigning and, and modernizing this structure, those are, those are our highest considerations. If fish passage, sluicing and then fish screening in the canal. Obviously the current canal does not have, I mean, fish would go down of it, go down the canal and end up at St. Mary's Lake. So they'd end up basically in, in the Mission Valley drainage rather than the Jocko drainage. Um, so we're, you know, we've had some pretty intense uh, meetings with our, with our engineer and um, our engineering firm. They have a, a very large team working on this with us. Um, here's some pictures of the North Fork Jocko Bridge. This, this is something that's a little more, easier for us to figure out. Yeah, the bridge is gonna be a lot wider to allow for more natural flow of the Jocko underneath of it. Uh, uh, so we, we kind of figured that out uh, at this point. Um, here's some pictures on the right of the, the, the Tabor feeder canal below the diversion. Uh, and then here's some seepage. This is actually down uh, the forestry Street coming in logged a little farther down the Tabor feeder, but this is seepage coming out of the canal. And now you can see it before it was covered up with all the timber and the brush. But you can actually see the water coming out and then obviously feeding back down towards the, the upper job or the north fork of the Jocko. Um, kind of a zoom in the area, you can see the bridge on the right. <laughs> we'll you know, we replace the access bridge. We're putting culverts to allow on the, the, the lead up on both sides of the bridge to allow water to pass underneath. Currently doesn't have that. Um, that's a, a, a big, really simple thing for us to, uh, 
to understand it and, and uh, modernize. The structure itself, we're, we're going back and forth. We've, we've actually went on field trips recently to, to look at what's the, the right screening. Um, we want to do it right, and, and so that means it's going to take a little bit of time. You can see the big uh, highlight here, the big hill, hill, hill slope cut. Um, it's been there for a long time. Uh, some of it is, is, you know, slightly natural for the, is the river made the bend there, but a lot of it is because we, you know, back in the day, the project came in and cut roads in and um, they just never revegetated. And that'll be a big, we have a big restoration component up here and trying to re-naturalize the site, uh, much like we are at Lower Jay. We wanna, we wanna lessen the, the visual impact of, of irrigation infrastructure, um, you know, within our, within our each and every environment on the reservation. Um, kind of some highlights here of the areas we're looking at things um, like this, like I said, we're, we're a long ways from uh, finalizing our plans here. Uh, here's one of our fish screening options. This is uh, the farmer's screen um, here on the right. This is uh, the farmers uh, recently uh, installed at Derby Dam down in Nevada. Uh, uh, similar in the, the importance of this is the similarity in size of the volume we, we would need to divert. So we would have a very similar size system and trying to fit it up there has, has been something we, we're uh, uh, deliberating about and trying to tackle is, is raised a lot of questions with, within the team. Um, you know, we wanna do it right and we wanna get it right the first time. Some more screens. Um, there's a potential layout of a farmer screen up there. So we would have to have two, um, in series, two different channels coming off the river, two pipes, and then obviously, uh, as it leaves the the system on the left hand screen, um, screen water with with no fish, um, the fish would be back in the Jocko, uh, migrating down the North Fork to the main stem. Uh, Falls Creek is the next structure on the on the Tabor feeder, um, BI wind funded project. We're we're nearing final design and. Uh, uh, hoping to get that out for bid uh, this summer and then uh, you know uh, tackle when the proper uh, construction window is upon us. Uh, the north area of the Jocko is a canal conversion project so it'll be everything north of the Jocko River. Um, essentially we're, we're taking everything all the way down to the uh, to the start of our Valley Canyon. Uh, we've sized the system so that uh, you know it encompasses all the needs that the FIP has. It will, it will uh, simplify delivery. And one of the, the benefits for the producers in the area, and, and you know, we have a lot of uh, C, uh, CSKT land at the end, near the end of the ditch and a lot of uh, trust lands. But a lot of these guys will be see the benefit of pressured pipe. Um, so uh, uh, several of the producers here will, will no longer have a power bill. Um, so, uh, you know, it, not only will our, we have water conservation here, we'll also have electric, electricity conservation as well. Some pictures we have of the area showing um, some of the canal seeps, the leakages. Um, here's, you know, here's a stock water tank spilling over and, and obviously creates, uh, propagates a, a small wet land below it until the water, uh, you know, seeps into the ground. <coughs> um, we, you know, there's some tracks in here as, as community members of the Draco would know that aren't, haven't been irrigated in, you know, in recent memory, but we did design so that it, all the irrigatable tracks could be irrigated at the same time. Um, you know, we don't know, you know, 20 years from now, um, you know, you, you just don't know what the land use will be in 20 years. So we, we made sure the system was designed to, to build the needs of the community and agriculture at that time. Um, you see that the picture on the left shows the current system and the picture on the right shows our kind of our in black, our big backbone going between K10 um, down to March Road and then tying. So we'll have two tie-ins to the, to the main, the main K canal. Uh, K Canal itself will still be an open ditch. Um, there is some liner project that will go on where the current con concrete liner is, is becoming destabilized uh, as it comes through the canyon um, out into the, the upper end of the valley. Um, but as far as the, the remainder of K Canal will be, will we'll stay in its current condition um, into the foreseeable future. Um, our, our big uh, agenda here is just get, because of the, the ditch loss, to get the Cape Canal system uh, in pipe, and uh, then you know Casey Steeman is working to quantify those savings. Flathead River pumping plant, you know, we did a big electrical safety upgrade. Uh, boy, I mean the human safety factor is, is was enormous on that. 
So uh, that that's done. Now we're looking at things inside the plant. Uh, mod, uh, you know, the, the original bearings are still original uh, from 1939 manufacturing date. So we're <laughs> we, we're working with uh, the Bureau of Reclamation on a project there to modernize the bearings and, and find replacements and, and create inventory of that and align the shafts uh, with the Bureau of Reclamation mechanical team. There's also a Bureau of Reclamation uh, mechanical team impeller focus on modernizing uh, modernization of the impellers. Uh, <clears throat> and then uh, we have a Bureau of Rec uh, field geo team working on an emergency slope stabilization. You guys have been down the river towards the dam in recent years. You'll, you've seen the, the, the big clay bank above um, is, there's some serious concern that, you know, on the right rain event year, we, we could lose that slope and it could take out the, the plant building itself. Or, or you know, <clears throat> more recently, it's done some damage to the substation that, that powers the plant. So um, we uh, you know, got three things going on there concurrently. Um, and then uh, once we kind of get those going, moving forward, we'll start to uh, start to tackle the next uh, list of, of, of issues at, at the pumping plant to, you know, we want to bring that capacity in the 60 to 70,000 acre feet a year. Um, that, allevi that alleviates uh, water supply issues um, related to in-stream flows down the road here. Um, it allows us to keep more water in, in Post Creek, Crow Creek, and the Jocko um, for fisheries. Uh, here's a picture of the Placid, uh, which is off the reservation. Um, it's, uh, you know, it dates back to an 1866 ditch act that uh, FIP filed, I believe, in 1908 or 1910. Um, but we, we divert off Placid Creek up, up above Placid Lake in, in the Swan drainage or Sealy Lake drainage area. Um, and then uh, bring water around, drop it in up above Upper Jocko Lake. And, uh, and so we, there's, you know, it's remote. It's, uh, as you can see on the right there, the, there was a fish screen put in, um, <clears throat> and, you know, I think in the 90s. Um, but we're, we're looking at, at modernizing that and allowing for, uh, you know, we don't have to have a guy, FIP doesn't have to have a guy running up there. Plus, we'll do some uh, d ditch enhancements there as well to make sure that uh, we get all of our water, you know, in the lakes for, for irrigation and in-stream flow usage. Some pictures of us that we took this last fall. We all went up there on a, a field trip. <laughs> uh, something we just finished up. We're, like I said, we're, we're working to contract in the Charlotte planning area. Um, we're, we've, we've selected an engineering firm. We're working on contract mechanism there. So Charlotte, the plant, this area is about, you know, it's uh, from north of Post Creek, north of Post Emission, south of Crow Creek, Peter Canal down to, to Charlotte Hills, about 28,000 irrigated acres. And we're, uh, you know, we got Kick Norris Reservoir, Nine Pipes Reservoir. Looking at this, there's a whole whole approach, looking at the canals, looking at, um, you know, what's the right way to modernize this, this is not one ditch at a time, but look at the entire <coughs> delivery area. There's been a lot of um, return flows in Coleman and Dublin Gulch in recent years. Um, you know, and that's, that's not good for fisheries. Um, Barfoot and the team don't like it, and we got to help them figure out how to eliminate that. And also, you know, once the water is diverted, we want to let's put it on the fields, not uh, not just let it get all hot and return back to the system. So we're going to work on this. Probably be two years of planning and, and community meetings, and, and you guys will be involved. Um, and then we'll start to generate a, a list of projects. Um, and you know, first of May, but there'll be a series of projects to achieve the overall goal of the master plan that, that we'll develop. So, uh, you know, something that'll be coming down the pike here uh, <clears throat> over the next couple of years. Uh, I'll let Casey talk now. All right, thank you very much, Jace. Uh, as Jace mentioned, so holy smokes, that's a, it's a pretty broad overview and really just sort of hit the surface level of everything that uh, Jason really the rest of the irrigation infrastructure team is working on. Uh, so with that, there's a lot more information out there. Uh, it's a topic that's gonna touch multiple landscapes, multiple resources, and lots of people. Uh, so with that, that's a great segue. I would like to, uh, I would love to invite my colleague, Rob McDonald up to talk about some of the work that he's been doing uh, in terms of public outreach. Thank you, Casey, I appreciate that. Thank you, council. 
I'll keep this brief just to respect everyone's time and we're so close to lunch, but I really wanted to plug the meeting and plan for Elmo 3 to 6 p.m. on Wednesday from 3 to 6 p.m. That's what I call the irrigation roadshow. That's where you can get a chance to hear talks like, um, like Jace Smith, Casey, um, Seth Makepeace, along with the other streams that flow into this topic, tribal water registration, uh, the job possibilities, the Indian preference office is there. And um, a lot of questions that have come up as we're now in new governance with the compact being um, in place uh, since it was signed by the Secretary of the Interior, September 17th. That's off the top of my head, is that correct? <laughs> Good, thank you. Thank you for the nods of confirmation. Uh, I hope folks had either watched online the opening talks that covered overview history and updating where we are. I highly encourage people uh, to come to Elmo April 6th and we're planning, it hasn't locked down. I haven't told Elmo or Arlie, but they have been very accommodating. Uh, the 20th, we plan to be in Arlie April 20th, uh, same time, three to six. So I encourage council, I encourage the community uh, general folks. I am getting calls from firms hoping to do business with the tribes. So all folks are being um, uh, looking for getting more familiar with this. And I highly encourage our people and our membership to become very educated about this. This is one of the more monumental events in, in, in tribal history and I'm proud to have a small part of it. Uh, with that, I'll, I'll toss it back to Casey. Oh, I did want to mention that um, there is been a lot of um, uh, work afoot on trying to explain all these multiple pieces. And a lot of times in my conversation, I'm hearing from people that the structures being built and this focus on FIP, it seems to put out this idea that we're only looking at concrete structures and um, work that rips open the land and repairs these old falling failing structures. And that's a positive thing, I believe. What isn't talked about enough, and I would love to introduce council to a more in-depth presentation of the work from workers like Tabitha Espinoza and the restoration experts. Um, she's leading conversations with uh, the preservation department and the culture committees in finding ways of incorporating traditional knowledge into finding ways to bring back plants that have thrived in areas and then vanished and finding those areas, identifying them and looking for ways to bring them back. And it's been uh, some great conversations and some great vision that I think we'll really see flourish in the next um, several months, even years as we plan this out. So there's a tremendous restoration effort as well. There is effort on a website to make this information easier to find. Currently, uh, CSKT is looking at um, aggressive efforts to make the website much better and much more capable of serving the public. And I think that's been something IT and myself and Pastoral have looked at and now they're moving forward with it, which is fantastic. So there will be more information set up uh, on the internet. There'll be more public sessions. And of course, uh, I hope folks are paying attention to the Flathead Reservation Water Management Board. They just met uh, yesterday and they're gonna meet again next week. Those meetings are online and encourage people to pay attention. So with that, I'll fall quiet, throw back to Casey, take any questions if you have. Any questions for Rob? All right, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Rob. Having Rob on the team has been really great uh, and valuable towards helping with public outreach and, and getting that information out to the community. So if you have information or questions, excuse me, on these upcoming public events, I uh, highly encourage you to contact Rob. I highly encourage you to come to the meeting on April 6th and look for more information in the Charcusta on upcoming opportunities for public engagement. Thank you, gentlemen, for your presentation. I really uh, appreciate that. Um, you have a, you have more? Okay. Just, uh, thank you, Chairman. Just in closing, um, other work that we're working on, the Tribal Water Rights Registration Office is open. They have a website. Uh, 
Dan and Christina are leading that up. So I highly encourage people to look at that website and walk into that office if they'd like more information. Rob mentioned the Flathead uh, Reservation Water Management Board. And so those meetings are open and public and I would highly encourage people to attend those meetings so that they can learn a little bit more about that process. Our team is working heavily in strategic planning and that's going to include public outreach meetings. So look for more information about those. Also not talked about today, but I'm glad that Rob got to touch it a bit is our mitigation, reclamation and restoration of the compact implementation effort. So that's headed by our program manager, Tabitha Espinoza, and she is very focused on restoring ecosystem functions and restoring damages that were caused by the irrigation project construction and operations. And so I really hope, uh, I actually, I view that to be equally as important as a lot of the concrete and irrigation work that we're doing. So I really hope that there are future opportunities for Tabby to talk about some of the great work that she's been working on. We also have to do NEPA on all of our projects. And so we have Karen Bushy, uh, a newer hire who's done a great job at, at helping us ensure that we meet environmental compliance for all of our projects. And then lastly, the one topic that council is very focused on, that the executive staff is very focused on, that our department head, Rich Jansen, is very focused on, uh, that the IPO office, personnel office, and so many other departments are focused on, is creating opportunities for tribal members. And that's a topic that we have on almost a daily, daily conversations on. There's really tremendous opportunities for tribal members that are created as a result of the compact. And so that includes opportunities for tribal members to continue and finish their educations. There's lots of technical positions that are opening up now and being advertised and technical positions that are gonna open up in the future. But that also includes skilled trades. So a lot of the construction projects that Jace has talked about, those need uh, construction foremen, carpenters, uh, electricians. They need tribal contractors, uh, people who are able to get out there and get these contracts. And we want to make sure that tribal contractors are able to get as much of this work done as possible. Also, um, you know, general laborers as well. So there's really opportunities for tribal members um, on all all trades uh, created as a result of this compact. So this is something that everyone is very focused on. I highly encourage you to come to public meetings uh, to learn more about that topic um, so that you can set yourself up and, and we can really set our tribal community up for success. So with that, uh, please come to some of the public outreach meetings. Please come learn more. Please come share your ideas with us. We're always looking for public input and we're just really looking forward to continuing the discussion. So with that, Lem Lem Shpesia, we really appreciate your time. Uh, we'll shut up here so that everybody can uh, enjoy some lunch. We're very willing to address any questions that council may have. Lem Lem Casey and Jace and Rob. Um, I will note that uh, Dan and Christina are in the audience here. so. During lunch or after lunch, if they're, they're sticking around, they might be able to answer some questions. Um, with that, we will um, take a lunch recess. I will um, ask us to come back at one for uh, tribal member um, open floor mic for anybody that has anything they wanna bring up. And I will look for an elder to do a prayer for our lunch. And I'm looking at Jimmy. Thank you, Jimmy. Yeah, call on you today to uh, join us to uh, bless this food that we we're about to receive. We ask you for your guidance. We ask you for your blessings for everyone here. Ask for your safe trips home. Amen. Please sign up with uh, Jen up here at the front if you want to make comment after lunch at one. Lem Lemsh. <laughs>